Well, we're thinking today about a book in the Bible that's ancient, over 3,000 years old. And we're learning from a, a man named Solomon. Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote a number of books in the Bible. Uh, the book he wrote, uh, inspired, was inspired to write the Song of Songs, is a romantic book. And it was written when he was a younger man, in the, in the beginning of his life, and his kingship. Proverbs was written kind of through his life and the wisdom he gathered from God and from people around him and from looking at creation and the Spirit inspired him. And so Proverbs is this book of, of wisdom, but Ecclesiastes is written by him, inspired by the Spirit near the end of his life. He's traveled through his life, he's looking back, and he's doing what anyone does late in life is he's saying, what did I do that really mattered the most? What did I do that was worth doing? And in some moments, he's grieving over how he used part of his life, saying, I pursued things, and I sought things that were empty. And, and so when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you could ask yourself this question. You could ask the question, does the ancient book of Ecclesiastes have anything to say to modern people living 3,000 years after it was written? I mean, what does this book have to say to us today? Well, let me tell you who it was written for, the kind of people that this book was written for. And you in your own mind, you decide, is this contemporary? Does this book have relevance for our world today? Okay, Because this is the kind of people that Ecclesiastes is being written for. It's people who are feeling tired, weary, and disenchanted with the world. Do you know anybody who's ever felt tired, weary, and a little disenchanted with what's going on in the world? There might be people like that. You might be feeling that. Here's who else it was written for. It was written for people who are working hard, striving to be successful, but they feel like they keep coming up short. I'm working, I'm trying, but I never get there. I think that's a very contemporary theme. The book of Ecclesiastes is written for people who are exploring every kind of pleasure with no restraint and are still not satisfied. They always want more. That's a theme of our world. More pleasure, more pleasure. That'll, that'll satisfy, and it never does. Ecclesiastes was written for people who are looking for status and prestige and meaning, but they feel like they've never arrived. One more step, one more promotion, one more rank advancement, then I'll be happy. And when you get there, it's always a little bit more. Those are the kind of people that Ecclesiastes was written for. And, and let me tell you who else I think it's important to hear the book of Ecclesiastes. I think young people in their teens, in their 20s, because the book of Ecclesiastes helps us see what really matters most and what we should invest our lives in. And what's the best time of life to figure out what matters most and what you should put your life into? It's when you're young. Man, when you're 70, when you're 80, when you're 90, when you're looking back and you say, I've lived most of my life, man, I wish I learned this 70 years ago. What really matters in life? And so if you know a young person in, the, in, the, in their teens, their 20s, their 30s, and they're still trying to sort out what life is all about, this three-week series would be a nice thing to invite them to or to send them a link and say, you ought to listen to this message. It really gets dealing with that topic of what matters most in life. So as we begin the book of, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, we kind of look at Solomon's life stage. He's near the end of life. He's much older. And there's a tone to Ecclesiastes. And that tone is honest, raw reflection and at times mourning and struggling over what's happened in the past and kind of feeling like, man, I missed out on things. Or man, what really matters? And you feel that when you read Solomon's words. Listen to these words from chapter 1, verse 2. And, and I think as I was preparing this message, in the, in the last, it's been about two months or so that I've been working on this message and then this last week getting ready for, to preach it. Um, I think I felt the tone of Solomon more than I ever have before. So this is what he writes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. You can almost feel this sense of futility. The world just kind of sits in space and turns on its axis and generations come and generations go. But what does it all mean? What, what really matters? And what we discover from Solomon is that he has identified things that really matter 
And we'll look at that in week three. This is the three-week series. He's identifying things that really matter, but he begins by looking at the things that he thought really mattered, that he pursued with all of his strength, and he finally came to realize that's not what it's all about. And I think he's giving this Holy Spirit-breathed warning to us. My dad, my dad had lots of little sayings as I was growing up. My dad was very big on sayings and quote, quotes of different people. But one of his sayings was, a wise person learns from their mistakes. A really wise person learns from other people's mistakes. He said to me, son, you don't have to do every stupid thing to learn a lesson from it. Now, I think I decided to try to do every stupid thing uh, just because as a kid, I tried lots of dumb stuff. But, but he, he would say, learn from someone else's mistake. I think Solomon is saying, let me tell you, I had access to everything. This guy was the, was, the, was the king in Jerusalem, the king of the people of Israel. He had access to everything. He's saying, I pursued things that I looked at later and said those were meaningless. And so as we walk through this in, in, this, uh, in this message today, we're going to look at three different options, three things that, that Solomon said, okay, I'm going to find out if I can find meaning in this. Can I find meaning in pleasure? Can I find meaning in material stuff? Can I find meaning in accomplishments? He's, he walks through how he pursued each of these and how at the end of the day where he landed, and we're going to talk about how we can find true meaning in all things. So he begins here, pursuing pleasures under the sun. Pursuing pleasures under the sun. When Solomon says under the sun, he means on this earth. We're, we're, this, this didn't work as well in the first service because we were indoors. But right now we are under the sun, right? This is, you're living in this world. So he'll say, I tried all these things under the sun, on earth, living in this world, is what that means. I'm going to talk also about living under the sun, S-O-N, Jesus Christ. Because there's a contrast. We can live under the sun in this world, or we can live under the sun, Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you which one brings meaning by the end of the sermon. I think you'll get the message. But Solomon says, okay, I tried pursuing pleasure under the sun. Look with me at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And now Solomon is just being raw and being honest. And he says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. And I love this. My mind still being guided with, wis with wisdom. He said, I was still being wise, but I was trying to do foolish things. It's like, I'm not sure what he's... You know, I, I love how the Bible is just honest. You go, what? What? It's inspired by the Spirit, but it's honest. He's saying, I was trying to still be wise, but I was trying to test pleasure out to see if that would satisfy. My mind's still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens, under the sun, during the few days of their lives. So I'm saying, I did this, really did this, a life study. What brings meaning? What is good to do with these days of life we have? What really matters most? Now he goes on, uh, he goes on as he talks about you know, trying to find meaning and pleasure. And in chapter 2, he says this. He says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards, all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves, to, to, to you know, flourishing trees. He goes a little bit later, he says, I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and powers. And he, you know, he said, I got male and female singers. He said, I had a harem. Ask your parents later what that is. I'm not going to get into that. But you know, he, said, he, he says, I had all these things. And then in verse 10, he says, listen to this. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I don't even know exactly what that means. But when you're a king in the ancient world, and you have access to everything. He says, I, he says, I tried it all. Now, remember, Solomon was said to be the wisest man who ever lived. But even wise people do dumb things. You know why wise people do poor, make poor choices? You know why? Have you know? Because they're human. And everyone stumbles and falls. Solomon's looking back and saying, when I walked down some of these rabbit trails, and that's what it was. It was a rabbit trail. It wasn't satisfying. So let's think about us today in our world. What are ways we seek to find meaning in life through the pursuit of pleasure? And how's that going for you? I mean, we, do the, we can do the same thing. We can do exactly what Solomon did. We can say, I'm going to try to find meaning in finding pleasure. And there, that, that takes all kinds of shapes and forms. How about this? Culinary pleasures. Any foodies here? Anybody watch the food channel? Anybody, I mean, it's like, it's like, oh man, that's, that's huge. You go, oh man, I got to make that dish. And you eat it and you go, it, does, it is pleasurable. It's wonderful. But the ultimate meaning in life isn't found in that dish. Maybe for two or three minutes. <laughs> but, but not ultimately, right? But we seek pleasure, thinking that that will satisfy. 
physical pleasure, just doing things that feel good to us. And we pursue those things thinking that will give us meaning in life. When Sherry and I were first together and first started our relationship, I told her, man, I'd really, I kind of get a little tense in my shoulders occasionally, you know, and hey, would you like to try, you know, try a little back rub? And Sherry, and th- th- I'll, I'll reenact it for you. I'll reenact the entire experience. She goes, yeah, that's not my thing. And it ended for our entire 37-year marriage. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. That's not her thing. So I don't get that pleasure. But some people love, you know, but there's those physical pleasures, right? And you go, that was, that's wonderful. That's great. I know you feel so bad for me. I thought, it's okay. I'll be all right. I'll make it. Um, sexual pleasure. People, see, people are pursuing sexual pleasure of every shape and form, throwing off all boundaries. Thinking, well, that will satisfy me. Entertainment pleasure. Now, in a long day of work, now I get home, I'm just going to sit down on a TV or on my computer or on my phone. I'm just going to watch. I'm going to stream some shows. I'm just going to, you know, and I'm just going to find pleasure in just relaxing, letting my brain unplug and binging on some shows. And then, you know, at one in the morning, you wake up with like Cheeto crumbs on your pajamas and, you know, drool down your face and your, your, your iPad resting and you go, well, maybe that wasn't as pleasurable. But in the, you know, we pursue pleasure in so many ways. Gaming. There are people that are huge into gaming. It's like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to, Go after that. But the problem is everything you win, there's the next thing, there's the next level, there's the next, the next battle. It's, it's always something else. It's always the carrot on the end of the stick. Even like the next rush. The next, you know, I, when I grew up in Huntington Beach, Huntington Beach down in the south, Southern California. As I was younger, surfing and then body surfing, there's a place called The Wedge, one of the best body surfing breaks in the world. You can go online and pull up The Wedge, body surfing, big waves, it'll blow your mind. And you only go left, you can't go right because the jetty's there and the wave always breaks this way. And, I, and I, had, I spent hundreds of hours in the water there. And, and I could describe to you right now in detail the rush of getting a really good wave, dropping in, getting crushed in the sand and just like bobbing. And it's, just, it's like, oh man, that's, that's life. That's enjoyable. That's fun. That's, that was pleasurable for me. But it doesn't fulfill the true meaning of life. Now let me be, some, be very clear. All these things within the right boundaries... Culinary pleasures, physical pleasures, sexual pleasures. God designed sexuality. In the covenant of marriage with a man and a woman, it should be wonderful. All these things are good. Entertainment, gaming, a good wave uh, you know, at the wedge or a good run on a, on a ski hill or a good you know, walk on the beach. All those should be wonderful. But life's not about those things. Those are gifts, but our, they don't establish the meaning of our lives. And if we pursue those things, we're going to end up empty. And so here's what I would suggest. Finding eternal joy and satisfaction in the light of the sun, S-O-N, the Son of God. Under the sun, finding pleasures in this world, enjoy the good gifts that God gives, but don't make them about your life. Don't make that about what drives you. But if you find eternal joy and satisfaction in the light of Jesus Christ, in his joy, in his peace, in his goodness, in his promises, those things give meaning to life that no one can take away, that never leave, that last forever. And so here's what I want to challenge you to think about. This is a, a little thing I wrote up that I think is kind of the other side. You know, Solomon says when it comes to living under the sun, he says, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless, striving after the wind. Living under the sun in this world, just pursuing the pleasures of this world. But pursuing the pleasures that Jesus brings and the things of Jesus, I think we can say meaningful, meaningful. Christ is meaningful. And life makes sense now and forever under the sun, Jesus Christ. Find your meaning there. And that meaning can't be taken away. And so Solomon says, okay, pleasures, strike one. I tried it, it didn't satisfy Let's try wealth and riches. Striving for wealth, riches, and stuff under the sun in this world. For a lot of people, they're going, man, I'm going to find find my meaning in pursuing more and more stuff. So if you look with me at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we'll look at verses 10 and 11, and then we'll jump to verses 15 to 17. And and Solomon is just looking back on life. He's had everything, and and he says this. He writes this, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, Ecclesiastes 5. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? 
Yeah, I'll look at the car in my driveway. I'll look at this thing. We spend more time looking at things, insuring them and cleaning them than we do enjoying them. And, and so Solomon just says that, that, that was his experience. And then in verse 15, I love this. He says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. You come with nothing. And, everyone, and as everyone comes, so they depart. You can't take it with you. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Psalm says, I pursued stuff. I pursued material things. And man, I had what looked like everything. You know what he says? It didn't satisfy. Why? Because material things aren't the things that matter most in the world. And especially when you get late in life and look back, you get that perspective. What if you could learn that early in life and not spend all your time pursuing things that don't ultimately satisfy? So here's a question for you. Have material things and the accumulation of stuff truly satisfied you? Have, have accumulating more stuff, has that truly made you go, man, now I'm totally satisfied. This is the meaning of life. I now have these toys, these trinkets, these things. I'm totally happy because I got this stuff. They do studies to ask people when they feel they'll be content, when they'll be happy. Do you know the average person, when they will be content and happy is when they have 10% more. 10% more. You make 20,000 a year, okay. When I make 22,000, I'll be there. You make 100,000 a year, 110,000. But if you double what you have, you, know, you, you talk to me, and now they double what they have, and you ask them, when will you be happy and content? You know what they say? When I have 10% more. <laughs> it just keeps going out there. Because those, things, because those things don't satisfy. That, that's, that doesn't fulfill the meaning of life. I've got a really good friend in ministry. We've been friends for years, going back three decades. More than that. And, uh, and just a great brother. And his dad has done really well. Good, good man. Loves Jesus. But he's done really well. And he's never felt peace about his future. He's now in his 80s. I think he's in his 80s now. He's never said, I'm good. I'm satisfied. I have enough. He ran his own company. I asked his son, who's a friend of me one time, I said, it's not my business what your dad makes, but I know he's never, I know he, this friend had told me, my dad just never, he doesn't have any peace. He wants to keep working because he doesn't have enough to feel like he can retire. And I, said, I, said, I said, can I just ask, you don't know, have any specifics, but like, is your dad worth millions? And he looks at me, he goes like this. Everybody look up here. He goes like this. He goes, he goes. That's <laughs> all I did. He put his thumb and he goes, and I, I, I didn't ask him. I was, I'm, I'm thinking, more, worth more than millions, and he's not at peace. He's not content. Why? The, because things don't satisfy us, ultimately. They're, it's wonderful to have good gifts. It's wonderful to have resources, to be responsible, to save. And that's all good. But if you look at that as the primary meaning of life, you're going to end up where Solomon said, where you just feel like man, you're striving after the wind. And, and, so, and so he basically, um, Solomon goes on to talk about you know, what, you know, what really matters, and it's not the accumulation of stuff. It's not more and more and more things. And so here's what I would suggest. Embracing the riches and infinite wealth offered by the Son, S-O-N. Embrace the riches and infinite wealth that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offers to you. Do you know that the Bible says, when you put your faith in Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is yours. Do you know what that means? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms? Do you know what that means? If you do, tell me, because I don't know. I don't, I mean, it just means every spiritual blessing in the heaven. We have blessings beyond what we can imagine or dream in this life and beyond this life. When we have faith in Jesus, we have the family of God, the body of Jesus Christ. We have heaven as our home. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the love of God Almighty. We are wealthy, lavished with God's goodness. Enjoy the material things God gives you, but don't make your life about those. Make your life about what Jesus Christ gives you and what he's done for you. And when you make sure that the riches that matter most to you are the riches that Jesus has given to you and will give to you, then you can say, meaningful, meaningful, Christ is meaningful, and my life now makes sense now and forever under the Son, under Jesus, the Son of God. When I was a young Christian, there was a song that came out called Lord You Are. Some of you will remember, it was a really simple, this is back when the songs were like one paragraph long, and it was like a simple praise song, and you just repeat it for like 20 minutes, you know. 
But I remember this, in this song, we sung these words. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares to you. Some of you remember that song. You know, the first time that I learned that song, we started singing it, and I started singing it. It was nice. I liked the tune. Simple song. And then as we were singing, I had to stop singing. I couldn't sing it because I didn't mean it. Because I was singing, looking at those words, and I thought, I don't want to lie to God. And I pursue other things so much more than I pursue him. It was a wake-up call for my heart. Have you ever sung a, a song of praise and just known you were just lying when you were singing? And God, man, I don't know if I can say that. Or, or you say, well, I'm going to sing these words, but God changed my heart. I found myself when I was trying to be able to sing that song to say, Lord, this is my prayer, that you would be more precious to me than silver, that you would be more, more, more valuable than gold, that you would be more beautiful to me than diamonds, that nothing I desire compares to you. Lord, I'm singing this as a prayer, not declaring what I, where I'm at, but I'm, I'm praying where I want to be. But when we get to that place, it changes everything. We have contentment and peace where we are. So Solomon says, okay, if you pursue pleasure as the primary thing of your life, it's going to be strike one. It doesn't satisfy. If you pursue material goods and, and money as the primary thing in your life, what, what, what makes life make sense to you, it's strike two. Here's strike three. And Solomon tells us this, looking for meaning and purpose in accomplishments under the sun. Looking for meaning and purpose in accomplishments. My next accomplishment, my next, my next, next mountain to climb. My next raise, my next new position, my next rank. I'll be happy when I get my next accomplishment. Then I'll be happy. And Solomon said, that doesn't work either. Look at Ecclesiastes 2, beginning in verse 17. And Solomon just says, I'm thinking about all these things. He says, so I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All the work I do, all my accomplishments, he says, I'm struggling. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Listen to this. He says, I hated all the things I had to toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. He says, I've got all my accomplishments and I've got to hand them off to somebody else. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. He says, what if I spend my whole life working and attaining and I hand everything off and that person's a fool and they handle things foolishly. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil, all that I did, into which I have poured my effort and my skill in this life under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor, all I'd done, all I'd accomplished, right? Under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. Do you hear Solomon's heart? He's saying, man, all my accomplishments, all I've worked for, when I leave this world, I leave it behind. To who? And will they even be wise enough to deal with it? You know, we live in a world that, that sets up systems where we're always kind of seeking for a little bit more. And that, that's, not a bad, that's not a bad thing. If you work hard in a job, you can get a raise or you can get a new position. I think, and I see, I see Craig over here, in the military, do they have like ranks and levels that you can move up? And I'm not sure, but there's something like that in the military, right? Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> and it, like even within a rank, there's ranks within the rank, right? And it's, and it's, like, it's like, okay, when, well, when, when is the right accomplishment? Whether it's a rank, whether it's a title, whether, whether it's a new job or a position, whether it's where you fit on the org chart, that there's more people to answer to you than you answer to. And, and, and so we strive for those things. And Solomon says, at the end of the day, those things aren't the ultimate thing that life is all about. But rather than letting that be what life's about, how about this? And here's the, the final contrast. Finding peace and purpose under the lordship of the one and only son. How about rather than trying to go up, 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 up. And it, it, I'm not saying, it's, 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 I'm saying work hard. Those things are great. And, and get the next rank and get the next job. That's fine. But don't make your life about that because that will always let you down. But come under the lordship of Jesus. And you know what happens then? Your rank, your position, your place in life is established through Jesus Christ. And no one can change it and no one can take it away. In Jesus, you are called a daughter of the living God or a son of the living God. Okay. You know who can take that away? Nobody. That's a gift from Jesus. In Jesus, he gives you the status of his beloved. 
and he will never stop loving you. The greatest accomplishment you can ever earn is to come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ and take what he accomplished for you and receive it for yourself. You know what the Bible says in John chapter 10? No one can take that away from you. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. There's no height, no depth, nothing in all creation. What he accomplished is greater than anything we can accomplish. So, listen closely. Enjoy the pleasures of this world under Jesus the Son in a way that honors him. Enjoy the material things you can earn and work hard. Christians should be the hardest in any environment, anywhere. Christians should be the hardest workers. And work hard and earn well. But keep that all under the Son, Jesus Christ. And enjoy accomplishments and, and take those steps forward. Wonderful. Celebrate those things. I've had the privilege of celebrating with people here at, at Shoreline when they've had different steps forward and, and rejoicing with them. But let what Jesus has accomplished for you be what matters most in your life. And here's the beauty of it. Here's the, here's the wonder and the beauty is that when you put Jesus first and you say meaningful, meaningful, Christ is meaningful and all things belong to him so I live under the son, Jesus, all the other things make sense. Jesus put it this way. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Keep the first thing first. And so, I want to get, invite you to make a decision today. And this would be the decision. I will live under Jesus, the Son, as I walk through my days on this world under the Son. I live in this world, enjoy the good gifts that God gives, but don't believe that those things are what life is all about, that they will ultimately satisfy. And when Jesus rules as Lord over Everything else, if Jesus is Lord over the pleasures of life, if Jesus is Lord over how we handle our finances, if Jesus is Lord over how we do our work and how, what we accomplish, then all of those things have new meaning because it's all about Jesus. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. As we sit in this beautiful courtyard on this beautiful day, as many people are sitting at home online following this service, we would say to you, O oh God, may, us, may, may we not live all the days of our life under the sun on this planet pursuing as most important the things that aren't most important. But let us understand that living under you, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the leader of our life, you can make sense of everything else. We thank you, Jesus, for making it possible for us to live our lives in your care, under your leadership, under what we call your lordship, letting you be in charge of our lives. And then will you, Jesus, make sense of all the rest. Thank you for your word in Ecclesiastes. Thank you for a timely word, even for our world today. And may we leave this time really searching our hearts and humbly admitting if there's things we're pursuing as the ultimate end that just aren't. And let us seek first you and your kingdom and your righteousness and let you put the rest of the pieces of our life together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of words of invitation. Uh, if you are new at Shoreline, if you're new online, uh, we want to welcome you personally. And so if you would just text the word uh, per, uh, uh, welcome to the number you see on your screen, we'll respond back to you. If you're here in the courtyard or in your car and if you're comfortable doing so, uh, Patty and her team are right back at the final tent there. I don't see any balloons today. Am I missing the balloons or are we balloonless? Patty's waving. It's the last of the three tents going this way. They want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming and just get to know you a little bit and answer your questions about the church. If you need prayer, we believe in the power of prayer. We have a team at the top of the stairs here to the right under the Need Prayer banner and they'll be there to pray for you on campus. If you're at home and you need prayer, uh, all you need to do is uh, call the number you see and there's somebody live to pray with you on the phone or to the email, send your prayer need. We'll put it on our prayer list and that'll go out to all of our prayer team and they'll be praying for you throughout this next week. So you can send it in or you can call in. Uh, if you want to know more about becoming a member of Shoreline Church, uh, I do a class about once every three months or so. I've got a class today at one o'clock and it's going to be in the Pacific Room, which is in here to the welcome, big welcome sign and to the left, and I'll be in there doing a class at one o'clock. If you want to be, if you're at home or you want to go home and do it online, just go online and register for the class, and I will see you at one o'clock, and it'll be, I'll be doing it live and online at the same time. And so one o'clock today, membership class. And then finally, uh, this Wednesday night is my favorite Wednesday of the month. Uh, it is, is night of worship. We'll be outdoors for an outdoor night of worship experience at 615. 
It is going to be a powerful time of worship, so I invite you. Uh, I met five people this morning indoors at the service that said they were at, back on campus for church for the first time in like 13 months. And so if night of worship, go online and register so we can know who's coming. And also, if you register, you just need to say, you need to say, I need social distancing, or I can just do open seating. And then we can set up enough carpet squares close together for open seating and enough social distancing so everyone can get what they need. And if you want to come in your car, that's fine too. And now this time of year, 6.15, the whole service will be in the light. It'll be warm and nice, hopefully, and beautiful. So you can join us for that. I want to invite you to stand with me as we close our time together. As you go from this place, as you finish up at home, and as you roll out of the parking lot in your cars here and pack up your tailgating stuff, may you walk into every day not saying meaningless, meaningless, life is meaningless. May you say meaningful, meaningful, Christ is meaningful. And may he guide everything else to make that rich and beautiful too. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you Wednesday night, 615, night of worship. Get online and register for next week uh, for indoor or outdoor, and we'll see you soon. God bless you.